Let's pray. Shepherd of souls, you call us to an abundant feast at the table of your word. Open our hearts to feed on your goodness, that by the power of the Holy Spirit we might dwell ever more deeply in you. Amen. Our scripture this evening is the 23rd Psalm. Listen now for God's word. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Louisa Woosley was born in March of 1862 in the hills of Kentucky. She was brought up in a Baptist family and as early as the age of 12 began to experience God calling her into formal ministry. This caused her a deep anxiety, both because of what she believed about a woman's place in church and the household, but also because she didn't know of any other women who'd ever been preachers before. When she married her husband, a farmer, she prayed fervently that he might catch the gift for preaching so that she could do the work of the Lord at his side. He remained a farmer. Instead, Louisa continued to experience the call to preach and to serve to the point where she made herself very ill because of it. She read the Bible from cover to cover and made note of every place that a woman was mentioned. Upon finishing her reading, she determined that God had not overlooked women in the place and order of ministry, and so when the opportunity presented itself in 1887, for her to fill the pulpit of Cumberland Presbyterian Church, she did just that. Two years later, she was ordained by Nolan Presbytery, which caused all sorts of problems up and down the rest of Kentucky and the eastern coast. She served the rest of her life as a faithful minister, leading revivals all over the country. At the time of her death in 1952, our denomination was still four years away from officially ordaining women as ministers of the word and sacrament. Louisa was described as small in stature and very modest. This unassuming woman is not who you'd expect to find leading the charge for the ordination of women, but she is exactly who God had in mind, and praise be. If it weren't for Louisa's courage and her willingness to go where God was leading here, her, I might not be standing here tonight. If you've been with us since the beginning of the summer, you know that we've been celebrating the day of Pentecost throughout this entire season of Ordinary Time. In these past six weeks, we've walked with two familiar passages, the Good Samaritan and the 23rd Psalm. The first of which, while considering perspectives from our brothers and sisters around the world. We've engaged the 23rd Psalm, bearing in mind liberation and ecological theologies. And tonight, we encounter the 23rd Psalm from a third and final perspective, feminist theology. I wondered, as I wrote this, if there would be a sharp intake of breath or if folks would start to shift uncomfortably in their seats. Feminism is a loaded word, more loaded than perhaps some of the perspectives we've explored thus far. But I promise this isn't some man-hating, man-shaming manifesto as feminism is often portrayed in our culture. 
Indeed, the task of feminist theology is to call us to look far beyond ourselves, far beyond ourselves as men and women. I'd hazard a guess that by the end of tonight, you might discover that you are a feminist too. Elizabeth Johnson, one of the leading voices in modern feminist theology, wrote a book in 1992 entitled She Who Is. In it, she lays out the motivation of changing the narrative, beginning with the language we use to describe God, from one that is male-centered to one that's more inclusive. Whether consciously or not, she writes, Sexist God language undermines the human equality of women made in the divine image and likeness. This is why, Johnson might say, Louisa and other women in history who experienced God's call on their lives might have turned from it instead of towards it. Only men can be ministers because God is identified as male, so women must be less than, less worthy. Johnson says the result is broken community. Human beings shaped by patterns of dominance and subordination, it absolutizes a single set of metaphors and obscures the height and the depth and the length and the breadth of the mystery of the divine. Thus, it does damage to the very truth of God that theology is supposed to cherish and promote. She continues, the goal of feminist theology is not to make women and men equal partners in an oppressive system. It is to transform the system. The 23rd Psalm is a vision of community transformed. Though we often hear it at funerals and its words have comforted a countless number over millennia, the 23rd Psalm is inherently political. The image of a shepherd was a metaphor for a king or a queen. A good ruler was, in part, a shepherd who cared for his or her flock and tended to all of its needs. To say that the Lord is our shepherd is to say that an earthly ruler is not. This psalm is a pledge of allegiance to the God who provides more than we need. I can imagine Louisa Woosley praying this psalm, asking for God's guidance and providence, seeking healing from her ailments and comfort through the course of her discernment, reminding herself that God is her leader and not those who would keep her from the pulpit or the pastorate. When Elizabeth Johnson writes that the goal of feminist theology is to transform the system, it is transformation to a community in which all souls can rest and flourish. Not just those who ascribe to a particular set of values or who have a particular embodied way of being in the world. The recipe for this kind of community is not, says Rebecca Chop, simply to add women and stir. Nor is it, as Rosemary Radford Ruther adds, to divide up the pie differently. It is instead to design a new way of baking entirely. I was in a conversation about discernment for a congregation I served in seminary. This congregation, like Second, found itself in the midst of a neighborhood that was rapidly transforming. The church wanted to respond And a very sweet, well-meaning elder said, let's all invite someone who doesn't look like us to church this month. We are often well-intentioned when we desire and envision a worshiping community that has no dominant race or skin color, ability or age, or a set of beliefs and practices. It's not enough, however, to simply add diversity and stir. The kind of restoring and radically transformative community of the pasture of the 23rd Psalm doesn't come from dividing up the pie differently. It comes when members of a community are willing to allow themselves to be changed. We don't do things that way here, can no longer be a part of the vocabulary. Instead, the question becomes, how might we create a worshiping community together? 
that's mutually beneficial, affirming and life-giving to all those who wish to gather in worship and fellowship of the triune God. This kind of change requires careful attention to language and practice. It's messy. It will push many folks far beyond the boundaries of their comfort zones. It requires a bigger table, one where the once loudest voices speak up less so that others might have a chance to speak up for the first time. This kind of community is at the heart of the vision of feminist theology, restoration for all, transformed in Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. It's a place where there's no such thing as greener grass on the other side of the fence because the lush and verdant pastures of the Good Shepherd are available for everyone. Waters flow in abundance, enough to drink for all who thirst. The table prepared in the presence of our enemies is a table where we sit together because the enemy is no longer one another. Instead, the enemy becomes that which would divide us. This vision is a world in which the uniqueness of every person and culture is celebrated. A world in which that which makes us different is not a threat, but instead is an opportunity to learn more of the mystery of God as revealed in you and in me. The violent events and demonstrations in Charlottesville, Virginia yesterday are expressly not a picture of that promised kingdom where God reigns supreme. Indeed, sometimes it feels like we are walking through what the psalmist calls the valley of the shadow of death. Threats of nuclear war loom. Neo-Nazis march on American soil in numbers that sound more like 1930s Germany. Division and discord over a multitude of issues is reaching a breaking point. It becomes difficult to believe that goodness and mercy are anywhere to be found, much less that they follow us all the days of our lives. But this we know to be true. Even in the face of that which would have us believe the notion that some people are just plain better because of the color of their skin, or some other idolatrous reason, we know this. We follow our God through the darkness and into the light and pray that all may come to see divine goodness, the divine image in the faces of everyone they meet. If there is one definitive theological issue at the heart of feminist theology, it's just that, the Imago Dei. The doctrine that we, as human beings, are created in the image of God. The title of Elizabeth Johnson's book, She Who Is, comes from this premise. For over a thousand years, we've been using masculine pronouns and language to talk about God, even though there are plenty of places in Scripture where God is referred to with feminine characteristics and even, sometimes, pronouns. And so we have, for millennia, discussed He Who Is. What would it look like? What would our whole church and society look like if for the next thousand years we considered she who is? If we celebrated those things which we label as feminine but are also true of the nature and characteristics of God? What if we celebrated nurture over might, care over conquering, softness over strength? Human brains crave order. And we sort everything we encounter into a category. You're this, so you're not that. I'm this, so I'm not that. We create binaries and boundaries, and we'd go crazy if we didn't. But we also must know that God exists beyond those binaries and the boundaries of gender and race and sexuality and national origin and political persuasion. There is no one right supreme way of being in the world. God is male and female, black and white, young and old, traditionally abled and differently abled. We could look around this room, look at the person next to us, and all of what we see, God is. 
All of our language falls short of describing the magnitude of the God who leads us out of the darkest valley and into the light. So what if, just what if, we tried to encapsulate just a little more of that mystery with the language we use and who we include at the table? The binaries we create as classifications and distinctions and qualifiers don't matter in a kingdom come view of the world. Perhaps the only one that matters, the only us and them, is that God is God and we are not. The holy wonder is that the divine chooses to dwell in us, to create us in divine image, and to restore our souls. Louisa Woosley knew the calling on her life, even though it was radically different from anything she'd known or seen or experienced, and even though others tried her whole life long to convince her otherwise. The task of feminist theology and our task as Reformed Presbyterian Christians is to always be on the lookout for how God is moving in our lives and the lives of others. May we be open to the movement of the Spirit, the surprising, startling, unpredictable Spirit. May we seek to join with one another, different as we are, and follow the Good Shepherd wherever she may lead. Amen.